Hello, I am Dr. Wafa Ibadawi, a consultant histopathologist. I will be talking about pre-malignant glandular neoplasia of the endometrium. Pre-malignant glandular neoplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia is recognized by increased gland to stroma ratio that is an abundance of endometrial glands. Glandular architectural irregularity and complexity. WHO classification of endometrial hyperplasia 2014. Endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia that is non atypical endometrial hyperplasia. A typical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia. Please note that the terms of cystic hyperplasia, adenomatous hyperplasia, and simple and complex hyperplasia are obsolete. I will be speaking about endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia. General background. It is an endometrial glandular proliferation characterized by increased glandular density that is more than 3 to 1 glandular to stromal elements. It is relatively common and approximately 150,000 to 200,000 new cases are diagnosed every year in Western countries. It occurs as a result of an opposed estrogenic stimulation of the endometrium, such as successive prolonged periods of anovulation, estrogen administration, peripheral conversion of androgens to sterone in adipose tissue in obese women or patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Estrogen secreting ovarian neoplasms. It has no reproducible genomic alterations. It typically, typically occurs in perimenopause. However, it can be also seen in reproductive age and postmenopausal women. Patients typically present with abnormal uterine bleeding, such as hypermenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, intermenstrual bleeding. It is occasionally asymptomatic and diagnosed incidentally. Gross appearance of non-atypical endometrial hyperplasia. Grossly, the hyperplastic tissue varies with the extent and severity of the hyperplasia, ranging from no gross abnormalities to focal or diffuse polypoid thickening. In this photo, notice the presence of irregular white to yellow polypoid tissue and protruding into the endometrial cavity. Endometrial polyps and foci of adenomyosis may also be involved by hyperplasia. Microscopic features of endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia. Here in this photo, we see, we see an increase in the number of endometrial glands with the surface area exceeding more than 50% that of the surrounding stroma. Increase in gland to stroma ratio that is more than 3 to 1 glandular to stromal elements. Glands are irregular and often cystically dilated. Cytologic features are similar to normal proliferative endometrium. The cells can show mild cellular enlargement but retain smooth nuclear contours without distinct nucleoli. Some cases feature increased architectural complexity. 
Cytologic features are reminiscent of normal proliferative endometrium with pseudostratified mitotically active elongated columnar cells. The lining cells lack features of a tibia, such as nuclear enlargement and pleomorphism, irregular nuclear borders, hyperchromasia, coarse chromatin, and nucleolar prominence. In this case, the cells of endometrial hyperplasia are enlarged relative to the uninvolved normal endometrium with enlarged nuclei and nuclear pseudostratification. And mitotic figures are typically present, although not depicted in this image. Benign mimics such as florid secretory or gestational endometrium can be excluded by evaluating suspected hyperplastic proliferations on higher magnification. Metablastic changes are common with endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia, including xenophilic metablasia, papillary syncytial metablasia, squamous morula metablasia, mucinous metablasia, ciliated cell metablasia, clear cell metablasia. Metablastic changes is the nophilic cell oncocytic metablasia. The endometrial glands are lined by non-ciliated cells with abundant pink oxyphilic and granular cytoplasm. Nuclei are round and mildly enlarged with preserved low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Mucinous metablasia. Three different cases are present. A gland within a typical endometrial polyp is lined by a single layer of bland endocervical-like epithelium. Mucinous metablasia intestinal type, the goblet cells line the endometrial glands. Papillary mucinous metablasia. Endometrial hyperplasia with a squamous morula metablasia. Florid morula metablasia can cause obliteration of the gland lumina and a more complex histologic appearance, potentially leading to a misdiagnosis of carcinoma. Ciliated cell tubal metablasia, ciliated cell change. The lining of endometrial glands and or the surface epithelium consisted predominantly of ciliated cells. Glands showing ciliated metablasia are often cystic and individually disposed among non-metablastic glands. The ciliated cells, which have abundant oxyphilic cytoplasm, form short, rounded papillae. There is mild nuclear atibia. Hubmel reparative metablasia. Cyto cytologically bland glandular cells with apical nuclei projecting into the lumen. Surface papillary sensational metablasia. This process is reactive reparative in nature and is typically seen on the endometrial surface or overlying stromal breakdown. Note the pseudostratification and loss of clear cell borders along with hobnail cells. Clear cell metablasia. Clear cell change in endometrium glands, endometrial glands is most often associated with pregnancy, but can occasionally be an isolated finding with no apparent 
cause in a non-pregnant patient. The cells have abundantly a glycogen-rich cytoplasm. The cytoplasm has a finely granular quality. Distinguishing features from clear cell carcinoma include the non-invasive microscopic size of the focus and the usual absence of architectural and cytological atibia. Interglandular papillary metaplasia. Simple syncytial papillary metaplasia with short non-branching micropapillary lined by a single layer cells with pale xenophilic or mucinous cytoplasm, sometimes ciliated. Complex papillary metaplasia with confluent and crowded papillae. It is highly associated with concurrent or subsequent endometrioid neoplasia, that is conventional atypical hyperplasia or even carcinoma. The absence of significant nuclear atibia separates complex papillary metaplasia from carcinoma. Differential diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia without atibia. It includes normal proliferative endometrium, disordered proliferative endometrium, cystic atrophy of endometrium, endometrial polyp, atypical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia. Proliferative endometrium. Irregular glands may be present but only focal, less than 10%, and small and only mildly dilated. Proliferative endometrium in the vast majority of glands is characterized by cellular blue appearance at low power, round two tubular glands that is round donut or straight tubular shape, even regular spacing between glands, tall pseudostratified columnar epithelium in glands, numerous mitotic figures in glands and stroma. Disordered proliferative endometrium. It commonly occurs in perimenopausal women, frequently in the setting of anovulatory cycles. Unlike hyperplasia, the disordered proliferative endometrium has irregular glands which do not exceed 50% of the surface area. It is continuum with persistent and opposed estrogen stimulation, which can lead to endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia. Frequently, both conditions coexist in the same sample patient. Cystic atrophy of endometrium. It is usually seen in elderly women. It shows prominent gland dilation. The glands are lined by simple non-stratified layer of low cuboidal cells to flattened epithelium devoid of mitotic activity. The stroma is compact or densely collagenous. There is typically a smaller volume of tissue than in endometrial hyperplasia in endometrial curettage. Endometrial polyp is an exophytic benign neoblastic proliferation of endometrial stroma with an admixed non-neoblastic glandular component. Here in this photo, we see a large polyp filling the endometrial cavity and extends into the endocervical canal. Here we see a huge endometrial polyp filling the endometrial cavity. We see also a smaller endocervical polyp and a subserosal 
Layo Mayoma. Endometrial polyp. Cross section shows an exophytic pedunculated lesion composed of markedly irregular and dilated glands and fibrotic stroma. Glands are variably sized, many cystically dilated. Stroma is fibrotic and less cellular compared to the endometrium functionalis. The glands may be lined by an active pseudostratified epithelium containing mitotic figures or in the post menopausal patient by a flat inactive epithelium. Thick-walled fissures close to the surface and irregular dilated endometrium glands are characteristic. Endometrium polyp differs from non-atypical hyperplasia in polyboid configuration, presence of dilated thick-walled blood vessels, stromal fibrosis or compact appearance of the stroma, glandular irregularity with arrangement parallel to surface endometrium epithelium, absence of glandular crowding. It is important to keep in mind that hyperplasia without a tibia or a tibical or carcinoma may be present in an endometrial polyp and are diagnosed using the same criteria as are used in the absence of a polyp. The glands and stroma of the polyp are unresponsive to progesterone stimulation and retain their integrity throughout menstrual cycle. Prognosis and therapy. Non-atypical endometrial hyperplasia is usually treated with progestins, with the response rates varying from less than 40% to 100%. It is regarded as benign with a high chance of regression. It has a low risk of progression to endometrial carcinoma, 2% to 4% after 20 year follow up. The risk increases if the cause of hyperestrogenism persists untreated, likely via genetic mechanisms leading to leading ultimately to a typical endometrial hyperplasia endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia i'll be talking about a typical endometrial hyperplasia endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia general background a typical endometrial hyperplasia is present in 1.2% to 1.4% of the endometrial biopsies. It usually occurs around many bows. It is increasingly more commonly seen in young women and adolescents as a consequence of long-standing anopause estrogen stimulation. Patients present with abnormal uterine bleeding, such as postmenopausal bleeding, hypermenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, intermenstrual bleeding. Molecular profile reveals mutation of P10, KRAS, and beta catenin, inactivation of PAX2, and microsatellite instability. A significant subset of patients with this condition will have endometrial carcinoma on hysterectomy. Most, but not all, will be well differentiated, FIGU grade 1 and non-invasive. Microscopic features of a typical endometrial hyperplasia. It is typically seen as a discrete expensile focus that is distinct from the surrounding endometrium. 
It is characterized by crowded glands measuring more than one millimeter in greatest dimension. The glands are lined by cytologically altered cells. There is a little intervening strom. It is composed closely of closely packed individual glands with a gland to stroma ratio exceeding one to one. At high power, the neoplastic cells have large round nuclei with pseudostratification and inconspicuous nucleoli. Note that the cells demonstrate cytomorphology significantly different from the background endometrium. See in active glands in upper right aspect. Epithelial metaplasia can involve neoblastic and normal endometrium. Isenophilic metaplasia, papillary syncytial metaplasia, squamous morula metaplasia, mucinous metaplasia, ciliated cell metaplasia, clear cell metaplasia, papillary cell metaplasia, hobnail metaplasia. Differential diagnosis of atypical endometrial hyperplasia. In practice, the most useful feature to distinguish atypical endometrial hyperplasia from well differentiated carcinoma FIGO grade 1 is the absence of a stroma between adjacent glands, that is, effacement of the endometrial stroma. It reflects invasion in the absence of destructive infiltrative growth. It is seen as confluent, back-to-back, -back, or cribriform glandular growth or microacena formations. Extensive papillary and villoglandular architecture, marked cellular atypia beyond that usually seen in atypical endometrial hyperplasia, However, the degree of atypia between the two is usually similar. Desmoblastic stromal response in the vicinity of infiltrating glands, presence of areas of purely solid epithelium. Additional findings suggestive of carcinoma include necrosis, foamy macrophages. FIGO grade 1 endometrial endometrioid adenocarcinoma showing cribriform pattern, villoglandular pattern and cellular stratification, malignant nuclear features and mitotic figures. FIGO grade 1 endometrial endometrioid adenocarcinoma with a confluent pattern a dysmoblastic reaction, a microglandular pattern that is microacena formations. FIGO grade 2, architectural grade 2, nuclear grade 1. Here in this photo we see well-formed glands which are admixed with solid non-squamous nest of tumor with the latter comprising more than 5% but less than 50% of the overall tumor. Glandular and solid areas have generally uniform small round to, small to oval nuclei with granular chromatin. Single grade 1 endometrioid adenocarcinoma, architectural grade 1, nuclear grade 1. Here in this photo we see well differentiated glands which are back to back with foci of fusion. Here we see back to back and fused well differentiated glands having mucinous features. In this photo, we see myoinvasive endometrioid adenocarcinoma with pushing 
and infiltrative patterns. Here in this photo, we see endometrioid adenocarcinoma within a lymphovascular space showing some mammatous calcification. Here we see endometrioid adenocarcinoma with numerous formy histiocytes in the stroma. The degree of atypia between a typical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia, and well differentiated endometrioid adenocarcinoma FIGO grade 1 is usually similar. They show round to oval nuclei with uniform chromatin, that is FIGO grade 1, architectural grade 1, nuclear grade 1. However, when nuclei show marked cellular atibia beyond that usually seen in a typical endometrial hyperplasia that is somewhat enlarged rounded and have granular to vesicular chromatin with occasional small nucleoli endometrioid carcinoma figure grade 1 architecture grade 1 nuclear grade 2 is diagnosed this is a case of well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma arising in an atypical endometrial hyperplasia. In high power, while stroma can still be appreciated around most of the neoplastic glands, there is focal cribriform architecture and confluence bordering on early well-differentiated carcinoma. The confluent glandular papillary proliferation reflects invasion in the absence of destructive infiltrative growth. In summary, a typical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia, should not have cribriforming glands, microacina formations confluent glands, back-to-back -back glands, labyrinthine intraluminal connections, areas of purely solid epithelium, necrosis intervening endometrial stroma replaced by pools of neutrophilic debris, foamy histiocytes, lymphovascular invasion, stromal alterations suggesting Invasion such as dysmoblasia, myofibroblast, edema, inflammation, myoinvasion. In other words, a typical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia, should not have features indicative of carcinoma. Please note that. Uncertainty in the differential with well-differentiated carcinoma, FIGO grade 1, persists in some cases. For reporting purposes, can be described as at least a typical endometrial hyperplasia, endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia, or AEHEIN, bordering on well-differentiated endometrial endometrioid carcinoma or AEHEIN cannot rule out well differentiated endometrial endometrioid carcinoma. Both conditions will in general receive the same treatment. Prognosis and therapy. Given its frequent association with concurrent and subsequent endometrial carcinoma, the standard treatment for AEHEIN is surgical. That is simple hysterectomy and bilateral salvinjo or ophorectomy. For fertility purposes for young patients, hormonal treatment with high those progestins is a valid temporary alternative. Depending on the diagnosis on follow-up sampling, the clinical outcome is classified as 
resolution in approximately 75% complete response, persistence of atypical endometrial hyperplasia, progression to endometrial carcinoma. It has a 45-fold increased risk of developing carcinoma over time. It is associated with the progression to endometrial endometrioid adenocarcinoma in up to 28% of cases without hysterectomy after 20 year follow up. I will be speaking about serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, SEIC. Serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, SEIC. It is the deputative precursor lesion of serous carcinoma. SEIC is seen in atrophic endometrium of older postmenopausal women. Here in these photos, we see several glands which are lined by malignant cells with high-grade nuclei interspersed among atrophic glands. The nuclei are stratified with papillary tufts. The lesion is characterized by epithelial cells that show marked nuclear abnormalities identical to that seen in serous carcinoma of the endometrium, yet lacking an invasive component. The SEIC cells display markedly atypical nuclei with high NC ratio, multiple prominent nucleoli, and numerous mitotic figures. Tufting is common as the cell becomes discohesive. Here we see apparent nuclear expression of P53 protein, a strong and diffuse pattern in the high-grade nuclei. This is called the mutant pattern. Here we see diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic P16 immunostaining. In a subset of cases, SEIC shows a complete absence of P53 expression. It is called the null pattern due to a loss of function of TP53 mutation. SEIC is often found in the presence of frank invasive carcinoma, typically serous. Serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma or serous carcinoma confined to the endometrium generally has a good prognosis. However, a few cases have metastasis involving extrauterine organs. These are the references. Thank you.